very good morning to one and all present. Today marks the 76th session of conducted by the study circle. Uh, today's session is the second in the series conducted by Dr. N. V. Badarinath, former residing, presiding officer of DRT1 Chennai. I invite Mr. Vaidinathan to give a brief introduction. Of this. Good morning to all. Welcome you to welcome you all to the second session of the Law of Pleadings. The first session proved to be very useful to the members. And I hope the second session will also carry forward the same legacy. I thank you all for joining this meeting. With this welcome address, I request Mr. Speaker of the day, Mr. N Dr. N. V. Badrinath to address us. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, all. Yes. Well, uh, when Mr. Uh, Siva Shanmugam has said that the first session was very productive, I'm afraid whether that statement is correct or not. The reason is the effect seems to be uh, not as stated by Mr. Siva Shanmugam as the number of participants has come down from what we had on the first. Well, I'm not taking it as a disappointment uh, for the organizers or for me, but in a lighter way, I'm saying. Uh, but still, I'm happy that some of them have once again taken courage to be once again before uh, this session and uh, to del in the process of deliberating uh, on the topic uh, pleadings. Well, reasons can be many, maybe that there many will be joining in due course. Fine. Uh, just as a recapitulate to what we have done on the previous session, I just wanted to take a few points once again to the memory of everyone so that we can proceed further on the foundation already late. Well, we were discussing the topic pleadings in the civil proceedings. I said that the threshold, that the topic that we are discussing today is with reference to civil suits alone, because the pleading, the effect, the rigor is tested in the backdrop of the nature of the proceedings. As I already said in proceedings before a rent tribunal or before a family court or motor accident tribunal, where there is application of CPC, order six is not seen or applied with the rigor that we would apply in a suit which is civil in nature. So I already said that my speech is aimed at youngsters and the seniors who are present here are only the invigilators of what I am stating here. Well, uh, am I clear, audible? Fine. Uh, on the previous session, we have discussed the what is meant uh, discussed about what is maintained in that process we have referred to order 6 rule 1 and had some discussion on what to be pleaded and what need not be pleaded and we have also had a discussion on the length of the pleadings, keeping in view the section, the wording in the section, which demands the pleading to be concise. This discussion about the pleadings requirement being concise, we have tested in the backdrop of the fact that if anything we omit, if we fail to plead, can it be later pleaded as a matter of right? 
or even if we can through the assistance of the court under what terms and conditions of course this part is not discussed which we will be doing it today but we were very clear on the last occasion itself that every care should be taken to make necessary pleadings keeping in the context the nature of the relief the nature of the suit that we are intending to initiate we already discussed it in constraints that the lawyers face while making a plea either a plaint or a written statement and we have found that these constraints are not exemptions notwithstanding these constraints one has to make a proper foundation to the list lest the list may face problems in its journey till it is decided so now order 61 having discussed fairly for a considerable length of time let us see that what further requirements are to be complied with while we make the pleading and every time we discuss this topic you also see whether the wording in the section that pleadings be concise is used in what context when one breath the law says that you have to take all the pleas and 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 base your case on complete factual backdrop at the time of filing it said then what is the purpose or meaning in again cautioning the parties to be concise this a uh, question of mind will assume importance when we go further in our discussion especially when we refer to the remaining sub provisions in order 6 therefore let me at the outset tell all the youngsters who are present here and practicing in the original site be that a promissory note suit or a declaratory suit or a title suit mere injunction suit whatever it may be remember one thing that if you are a plain tape you must put all the facts in detail at the first instance though the law provides for an amendment of the plea or filing additional pleading yet that is not as a matter of right but at the first instance undoubtedly it's a matter of right however subject to order 6 rule 16 which we'll also discuss therefore for instance if you are filing a suit for recovery of money then normally the impression of the suit or is since i have lent money under a particular document namely either a promissory note or under a running account or under an invoice or under an agreement whatever it may be and that document is signed by the party and i am making a claim within a period of limitation enough if i say that the defendant has borrowed the money under a promissory note under a agreement loan agreement or under a 
running account or kata or all such kind of things. And file the document. And that may be sufficient for the suit or to establish his case. But remember the likely defense of the defend, defendant that he may, apart from pleading that the I have not borrowed any money, I have not executed the document, the document is forced, etc., etc. He may also take up other defenses as to the very validity of the contract under which the money is lent. The contract, as I said, could be a promissory note by way of a loan agreement, by loan of by way of a account which parties have agreed to maintain. Therefore, it would be advisable to the suitors to have regard to all the sub provisions of this provision called order. So let us first see that before we have a discussion. Right. Now, if uh, I think you can put on screen order six, which we have uh, done on the last occasion. Now, let us once again read order six, rule four. Very, very important provision. In all cases in which the party pleading relies on misrepresentation, fraud, breach of trust, willful default, or undue influence. Now, this is applicable to the defendant. We will discuss this a little later because we are now discussing about a suitor's role. But then see the next. And in all other cases in which particulars may be necessary beyond such as are exemplified in the forms aforesaid shall be stated in the pleading. Now, what are these particulars? Now, there is a format. If there are figures involved in the matter, they have to be written in words also. All that is what is stated that anybody would comply. But rule four says that in addition to that, particulars may be necessary, shall be stated in the pleading. What more the particulars required than merely filing a promissory note or a statement of account or a loan account, loan agreement, what all these kind of things. We need to know, depends upon, uh, I mean, uh, know in the context of the suit that one is filing. Since we are referring to the money suit, what could be the documents for a loan agreement? A loan agreement is one which, under which if it is claimed that the suitor has lent money to the defendant and that agreement is filed, that would prima facie disclose that somebody lending and the other side accepting that and receiving the consideration. Then what is the need for filing a statement of account? I think that is that becomes necessary in the light of sub rule four. Like in a declaratory suit, you are filing your title deed, which is a registered document having complaints of all the necessary ingredients of a sale deed. Then why are you filing the supportive document? And the sale deed is a prima facie proof of title under the Transfer Property Act as well. So why are we going for it? I think all this is because Order 6 Rule 4 mandates that additional documents, wherever required, 
also to be filed. So merely filing a, a document which is primary to the case and making pleadings on the strength of it, I am afraid may not meet. Now, why I'm saying this is, if you are not now making it in your plaint, then you are at the mercy of the court. Your absolute right will get diluted to the discretionary power of the court. Why should we invite that? Forget for a while the word concise. Go ahead with giving further details in support or to corroborate your main contention. Otherwise, if you want to file a statement of account after filing a suit based on a loan agreement, certainly there would be objections. Now, in this context, there is another obligation on your part. Please go to order seven, rule 14, which is relevant at this juncture. The amended uh, code of civil procedure had introduced this provision. If you go to 14, sub rule two and three, is a relevant provision at this juncture, where any such document is not in possession of the plaintiff, he shall, wherever possible, state in whose possession or power it is. Number uh, three, a document which ought to be produced in court by the defendant. Okay, we'll come to this when, okay, we can read here, we can later uh, link when we discuss defendant's requirements of pleading. A document which ought to be produced in a court by the defendant under this rule, but it is not so produced, shall not, without the leave of the court, be received in evidence on his behalf at the hearing of the suit. So, you are confronting with two problems by not filing the other documents and just simply relying on the principal document. That is, you must all, if you had not stated in the plaintiff where the other documents are, if you are a plaintiff, and if you are a defendant, if you have not pleaded, you need to have the leave of the court. In either case, you are at the mercy of the court. Therefore, many a cases, promissory note is filed, but legal notice is given, not filed at the plaintiff, at the filing at the time of filing. So, then you have to disclose in your plane in whose custody it was or the reason why you have not produced. Otherwise, you may have. Therefore, what I'm saying is this looks elementary, but see the problems we are confronting in the course of trial at the end of it, at the promise and notes with all the titles. That is the reason why all the additional things, apart from the document itself, you need to plead in the first instance so that you will be relieved of the problem of either requesting the court to grant leave or seek an amendment if it is permissible under the circumstances. As I said again, as I said already, you are again at the discretion of the court. So don't allow your right to be defeated and then depend upon the mercy of the court. So a plaintiff must make everything, every document which is required to substantiate the main case and the pleadings relating to the document and state or file the document as the case may be in accordance with the procedure so that even at a later stage while receiving of the same may not be that difficult unlike a case where you neither filed nor committed. See, I tell you there are cases 
in the trial courts where in a promissory note case the plaintiff pleaded that he had demanded the money despite demand defendant has not paid after all what is required in a promissory note a, a demand and refusal to pay is sufficient enough for cause of action to constitute the suit are to recover the money and perform but why the lawyers develop the practice it's not a law it developed the practice of issuing a notice the written notice and inviting some objections or at times whether or not they respond lawyers issue a notice why law under the negotiable instruments act it is not envisaged that the demand must be in writing it's a mere demand no verity said you need to demand in writing but why we are issuing notices it's only to show that a demand has been made because unless demand is made cause of action will not be there for a promissory notice it's a payable on demand so the demand if you make oral and at times you cannot prove then if you have given a notice legal notice that may come to your risk or you may have to then examine witnesses for that you may have to make a initial pleading that in the presence of so and so i have demanded but he has not paid because your cause of action for filing a pro note case itself when is at stake imagine how much unnecessary risk you have invited therefore my learned junior lawyers please don't take pleadings light because the foundation you are making should be strong as i said so keep all these in mind and make a, such a play which would be as strong as a granite so that the defendant cannot bite that so this is the emphasis here is on covering these aspects especially regarding the uh, meeting all the requirements regarding a main document and ancillary document make some reference and leave it at that as i again said we are very much on caveat that we are not allowed to plead law don't get draw an inference make a point straight leave it at that that inference will be drawn or evidence can be drawn and let it later on therefore keep this order sheets rule for later part in mind if you are a suitor then then you have one more sub rule eight also is very important sub rule eight sub rule 8 of rule 6 where a contract is alleged in any pleading a bare denial of the same by the opposite party shall be construed only as a denial in fact of express contract alleged or of the matters of fact from which the case may be implied and not as a denial of the legality or sufficiency in law of such contract c i have not executed this contract this i have not consented to it is a bare denial it is only relating to non execution but not legality there is a difference between non execution and legality if a contract is per se illegal or void or voidable then that is a a a denial that is a fact rather leading to the legality or sufficiency legal sufficiency of that contract whatever is the subject matter 
So, if your case is that the contract itself is not valid under law, please don't make just a vague allegation that contract is invalid, unenforceable, untenable under law. You must state that because in terms of section 10 of the contract act, contract requires certain conditions such as parties competency, legality of the consideration, then pre-consent, besides the object being lawful. Therefore, if you are saying that you have not executed a contract and you are not questioning the very legality of the contract, it is different. But from the circumstances pleaded in the plaint, if it appears that it is a case where the document, the contract itself can be assigned on the ground that it is not legal, then you need to say on what ground it is not legal, lest a bar under Rule 9, Rule 8, sub so Rule 8 of Rule Order, Order 6 will may be pressed into by the, by the plaintiff at the time of trial and prevent you from leading evidence in those lines or making an argument even in those lines. Because see, a validity of a contract is not a pure legal issue, let me tell you, because certain factual aspects are required in order to find whether a contract is legal or illegal. Not in every case that on the threshold without any factual base, you can say it is illegal. You need some factual base to assert whether or not the contract is legal. Therefore, when a contract is challenged and the challenge also is with reference to legality of it, please don't stop or don't merely say that the contract is not valid, therefore is not binding on me. You need to go further. See, this is so important and it is so relevant not only from the viewpoint of subrule 8, but also again come back to subrule 4. Please come back to subrule 4. Both have to be read together. Of course, the context varies a bit, but nevertheless, the purpose is the same. Now, let us see 4. In all cases in which party pleading relies on any misrepresentation, fraud, breach of contract, willful default, or undue influence, then the particular shall be stated. Now, let us link this with rule eight. You are denying a contract that you have not executed. On what ground? Is it that you are, see, if you simply say, I have not executed the contract, I don't think you would succeed in the matter. You need to state on what ground? Is it misrepresentation? Is it fraud? Is it undue influence? These are the facets basing on which the enforceability, legality of the contract is ultimately tested. You know, a contract consent is, must be free. So these are all the facets that take us to decide whether or not the consent that plaintiff had claimed from the defendant is free or not. Therefore, in a written statement, apart from attacking the execution of that document, whatever is it, or performing that act, whatever act that the plaintiff claimed that you have performed in his favor, then you need to, then, then, when, 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 when your defense is also that your consent is not free, you must state in detail 
how it was, how the coercion took place, how you were misrepresented, what how you there was an undue influence on you. You need to make a details of it, lest simply saying fraudulently obtained. So, or I misrepresented. I say it's not enough. The circumstances that led to the fraud, the circumstances that led to misrepresentation, must invariably be pleaded, lest you will not be allowed to lead evidence later, because you can't claim by yourself that you are misrepresented. You need to lead evidence. either oral or documentary or both but if you have not made a pleading at all then how would you expect law will not allow you plaintiff will pounce upon you and say you are not entitled then it is a matter of again inviting the power of the court which is which again is the discretionary therefore why i am saying this thing i have come across many suits during my tenure in bhart the defendant pleading simply misrepresentation fraud blank papers simply one sentence my signatures were taken on blank printed forms right when you have signed on a blank printed form you have volunteered to sign you know the risk of signing but if you have said that further i was called for a purpose i rather i went there for a different purpose and during the course of discussions which relate to a particular transaction and i was asked to sign on these papers the group which is not intended to be used or whatever that therefore i subscribed my signatures with an understanding between me and the plaintiff that whenever it is filled i will be called upon because an incoherent instrument can be pressed into service i think 120 of the indian evidence sorry negotiable instrument act you can banker can take a blank check with your signature and he can fill that that has got some minimum limitation is but if i am right 120 of the negotiable instrument sign would permit it so banker or the lender would always be in defense of all that now why i am saying this is simply saying that my signatures are obtained or i have signed on blank papers i was misled is will carry no weight we would see the particulars if you explain the circumstances under which you were made to sign i am sure that defense may come to your rescue otherwise a person signing the blank note or a blank paper takes with it the risk also because you, you know that a blank paper signed can be used for purpose which are adverse to your interest therefore an elaboration is needed this should find place in the written statement as envisaged under order 4 then one more thing we always use the word malefide intention in civil proceedings not that menseria that we talk about in criminal in civil court with a malice malicious intention the suit is filed the malice maliciously obtained this document so this is very frequently used but when we are using it please see sub rule 10 of order 6 it has a context again either for the plaintiff or for the defendant see this is uh, what happens is normally when we draft a plaint or a, a statement we focus more on the relief part and uh, and uh, tailor the 
document pleading meeting that requirement and in the process at times we may lose attention to this therefore just as a reminder everyone knows these sections i am sure but we have to get it we, we have to remember this when we draft it so that there will be complaints of the requirements which would definitely reduce the objections that one can take against the plaint now please see sub rule 10 malice knowledge wherever it is material to allege malice fraudulent intention knowledge or other conditions of mind of any person it shall be sufficient to allege the same as a fact with a, without setting out the circumstances from which the same is to be inferred c c10 and c4 there is a huge difference when you want to say misrepresentation fraud breach of trust willful default on you influence then you need to state the particulars but when you wanted to say that maliciously done an act which you are complaining of sufficient to allege the same as a fact without setting out the circumstances so the sufficiency here is set it out without alleging the facts that led to the pleading called malice so when when certain things are required to be pleaded in a particular manner either by the plaintiff or by the defendant the compliance of that procedure would be a healthy sign and would ensure a comfortable trial either for the plaintiff or for the defendant otherwise at every stage in the trial uh, questions as to the competency of the parties in raising it admissibility of the please take it all these things will come in the way and may delay the trial therefore in so far as the malice is concerned it is not required to say in detail malice is to be alleged however i am again cautioning the juniors here that we are only talking about a pleading because pleading is the basis for leading evidence without pleading the you can't lead evidence so if malice which you feel is an important factor in the list either on behalf of plaintiff or on behalf of defendant then if you are sure that the circumstances you have already elicited in your plaint or the written statement are enough to establish malice mere pleading of malice is enough but if for any reason you feel that malice which is very vital for the case of the plaintiff or the defendant then it is suggested that it be stated in detail so that the evidence you can let in to substantiate that plea this section is not a bar it only says that enough if you state but i am having my own doubts whether this section would exempt the parties from pleading uh, from 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 leading evidence without any pleading as to how the malice alleged is stated in the plea this again a debatable thing that depends upon the uh, defense resistance that one may have at the time of trial that's why i always say avoid as many likelihood bills that the parties may face 
when the matter goes to trial. Because till such time the matter goes to trial, everything is in dormant, everything is silent. Only when matter comes to trial, then things started, start exploding. So all problems will then emerge. Therefore, this malice part is to also to be taken care of by way of amendment caution. Then we just refer to 15 for uh, continuity of our submissions. No much discussion is required because it requires about verification. Now this verification of the pleadings earlier before amendment 2002 was without filing any affidavit. But today it is by way of a, an affidavit of the sutar because if what is stated in the plain declared to be true and correct is found to be wrong and the person can be taken to task for filing a false plea. There are two things the court itself can initiate an action. Secondly, the such the, the false pleadings can be ordered to be struck off by the court itself as the case. So be careful while verifying the party giving an affidavit that the contents are correct. If it is proved to be made with a malignant intention, to then and if it is an abuse in order to abuse the process of the court, then parties will face the risk of facing exemplary costs. That's a different field. Only thing is to caution at this stage is to avoid so that your affidavit which you are giving will not trouble you, you later. Now, let us see order six rule 16. 16, no doubt has no direct role as far as the preparation of pleadings are concerned. Nevertheless, it cautions the parties to avoid unnecessary, scandalous, vexatious pleadings. Because you are not expected in a civil dispute to resort to such things except protecting your civil right, which is available to you under the statute. And therefore, normally this making baseless allegations or vexatious allegations or scandalous allegations should be avoided by either plaintiff or the defendant. And this, see, there is a, we have 16 and we have 17. 17 is amendment. 16 is striking out the pleadings. There is a difference between 16 and 17. 16 is, is striking out a pleading made by either party in the pleadings by the court at any stage of the proceedings. For instance, if the court at the time of framing the issues, which is the court is normally expected to read the pleadings and also the documents. Remember order 14 rule two, which speaks about framing of issues. Order, order 14, yes. Issues can be framed or rather shall be framed not only from the pleadings but also from the documents you are relying on. So at the time of filing the plain or at the time of filing a written statement, if you have not put that relevant document or if you have put only the main document but not other documents that support your case, then you are also 
facing the problem of an issue not being framed either in your keeping burden on your side or burden on the defendant side therefore filing of a document along with the pleadings is very much essential now coming back to the order 16 sorry order 6 rule 16 striking of pleadings if it is found from the pleadings or from the document file by either side that it is scandalous unnecessary frivolous such portion of the pleading the court can direct either at the time of framing the issues or if it is not seen and found later at the time of trial or before passing the judgment this power is available with the court therefore avoid such so that you will not incur the displeasure of the court at uh, some stage of the proceedings warranting a direction to expunge or strike off or remove that portion of your plea now let us come to 17 order 6 rule 17 which is a very important provision relevant for our discussion now earlier we have discussed that everything that is required to give full strength to the case of the plaintiff or the defendant as the case may be be pleaded keeping in view the provisions such as sub rule 4 sub rule 8 sub rule 10 of order 6 of code of civil procedure now for some reason or the other if one fails to make a pleading then or made a pleading but that is found to be inappropriate or incorrect and require an amendment then the law has provided a remedy but as i said in the beginning earlier it was your right now you are slipping into the discretionary power of the court that is the difference but nevertheless you need not worry much that as i failed at the first instance i lost the opportunity perpetually it's not so you all know it very well but the question is when an amendment can be promulgated now again what is the difference between amendment and an additional pleading there are you see the peculiarity or the beauty of this cpc is apart from having 151 cpc there are so many provisions if your amendment is not allowed there is another route no seeking additional pleading either additional written statement or additional pleading this is so every stage there is a pro process where what cannot be achieved directly can also be achieved indirectly but the indirect or the secondary process of improving your pleadings or strengthening your pleading be that your plaint or be that your written statement is not as a matter of right it is subjected to several rules and the case law that is now being developed from time to time and today we are going to discuss the law on the amendment of pleadings within the time frame that we have now amendment of pleading see there are the if we discuss the post 2002 amendment it is 
rigorous, unlike pre-2002 amendment. Because if you see the 76th amendment, it is at any stage. But now, post-2002, it is before commencement of the trial. I we will discuss in detail. So it's no doubt, it is no longer available for the parties to seek amendment at any stage of the proceedings. There is an embargo. So keep that in mind when you draft your plain written statement and try to avoid that situation. So that you will not be at the mercy of the court or the tribunal. Now, let us see, since 2002 amendment is sufficiently old, I think we can confine our discussion to the cases post-2002 because pre-2002 amendment cases the by and large, the case law was court can permit even at an appellate stage. The discretion was used more in favor of the applicants. It was very liberal. That liberal law would apply to the suits which were instituted prior to 2002. Since almost 19 years have gone, I think the suits which we have, of course, there are more than 20. 25 years which were also there, but they are straight. So let us confine our discussion to the suits instituted after the 2002 amendment has come into force. Now, this 2002 amendment, as I said, has created an embargo on the power of the court in allowing an amendment. Now let us see this. At the first part of the section, it looks very favorable to the person seeking amendment, but it is controlled by a provision. Therefore, it is required to read the whole section. Let us read this. The court may, at any stage of the proceedings, allow either party to alter or amend his pleadings in such manner and on such terms as may be just and call such amendments as such amendments shall be made as may be necessary for the purpose of determining the real questions in controversy between the parties. This is mutatis mutandis, the pre-2002 provision, because at any stage, the court can allow the parties to make necessary amendments for the purpose of determining the real questions in controversy. See, remember the object of the trial is to ensure that the real questions in controversy are decided on all aspects and laid to rest at the first instance so that at later stages, parties should not say that this is this not is decided properly and this is not fully decided. Then send us for remanding the matter back. So if the court feels that an amendment that is required will set at not the controversy, rather the real question involved, and the courts were of the view that such an amendment should be permitted. Of course, that should not lead to the, 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 the restrictions. I will come to it. But general view of the court was to allow amendments. This was the trend till 2002. But today, what it is provided that no application for amendment shall be allowed after the trial has commenced after the trial has commenced, unless the court comes to the conclusion that in spite of due diligence, 
the party could not have raised the matter before the commencement of the trial. Yes. Okay, so there is a rider, there is a fetter, an embargo to the power of the court, which will operate in the following manner. An application shall not be allowed after trial has commenced. So that is the embargo. If the trial has commenced, it shall not. Again, it has got further fetter. So not fetter. Here the fetter has been removed, subject to this. What is that subject to that condition? If unless the court comes to the conclusion that in spite of due diligence, the party could not have raised the matter before the commencement of trial. Therefore, there shall be a due diligence, due diligence on the part of the parties. Despite due diligence, if the parties fail to come in, fail to raise a plea before the commencement of the trial, maybe the court in its discretion can allow it. Now, this there's a lot of case law on this. And I have picked up the recent judgment of the Supreme Court. And one judgment in between the recent judgment and the earlier judgments. So that the trend of the courts, these judgments which I have picked up, will give an indication as to what is the trend of the courts, what is the mind of the court, what is the mood of the court in allowing an application which are filed post trial or after during trial, but not before trial. Now, before we go to that question, let us deliberate when the trial commences. Shall we have an open discussion on that? In a civil proceeding, please tell me when the trial commences. Actually, the word trial is not specifically used. If you go to order 18, it is hearing, hearing of this. So now the first requirement is that hearing should not come in, the trial should not come in. So when trial commences, is it when the PW1 is put in box? Is it when proof affidavit is filed? Is it when the written statement is filed? Or when the court posts the matter for trial? Can we have answers from the participants? Any answer? When the trial in the civil court commences, what is the stage? Um, one Mr. Chalimutu has uh, replied that trial commences on framing of issues and then there are multiple answers that trial commences once issues are framed. Once issues are framed, yes. trial commences. First day of hearing. The first day of hearing normally, sir, when the proof of it is filed. In normal circumstances, the, when the proof of it is filed, the first day of hearing, we can oh. normally presume that the trial commences. And mm. uh, if I may not wrong, I may say that uh, in exceptional cases, when under order 10, when court on its own tries to ascertain the real dispute between the parties, by calling both the parties, then at the stage also we may consider the trial as commences. And uh, if I may not uh, be incorrect, I may also permit you to say this. Stricto senso may not be correct. At a stage where order 7 rule 11 application is sometime filed. That is rejection. rejection. No? That's what I used to call a word that because you are not going to trial at no, all. That's not a trial at all. You are you are pre-entering the trial on the ground that the suit is uh, plaint is liable to be rejected. I, I, okay. 
okay so i i confined to order uh, the first day of hearing that is when proof of vote is filed okay. and order 10 thank you sir fine fine can we have uh, further views on this and because i wanted to get benefited by your views because my view may not be right may not be acceptable so your views value more any other view uh, mr kartik and says that uh, once the pleadings are completed uh, the pleadings once pleadings are completed the stage is trial yeah. and then when before framing up uh the another participant meera says that trial would commence only when the court rules on proof and admissibility of evidence mr godwin solomon raj says that trial commences after list of witnesses are filed list of witnesses filed okay that's good then that's about the reply okay all right let us now discuss on this what is a trial trial is when what is some when something is in dispute it is to be asserted whether the person claiming in the plaint is entitled for it or not because a suta we we say we, in the beginning of this topic we discussed a suta puts his grievance in the form of a plain before a court of law and prays for a, a relief that's called plain i he says a has encroached into my property by uh, uh, and uh, this is my document and this is the encroachment therefore direct the encroachment be removed by way of a mandatory direction let us say that is the prayer then when will a triable issue arises in this case when will the triable issue will arise a trial arises trial arises when see there there, there is here i want some discussion and participation because this is a a doubt that i too faced while i was deciding matters i will put it this way trial trial is the purpose of trial is to find whether or not the suitor is entitled for a relief right in case of a counter claim as the counter claim it is entitled now the necessity to go for trial arises when when the necessity arises supposing written statement is not filed defendant remained ex parte he had been given no opportunity to counter the suit he has not participated the court is entitled to look into the proof affidavit and decide it is not necessary that the plaintiff should be not necessary the plaintiff to be called into the box if the court is of the opinion that the material already available is sufficient to establish the case then allow the claim then is there any trial in it can that process be called the court tried the matter what is this trial we very regularly often we use this in that case can anyone say that a trial had taken place the facts are plaintiff suit remain undefended plaintiff documents and proof affidavit are examined by the plain by the court and court allowed the suit and passed a decree in his favor any trial involved trial is by parties 
trial trial involves the parties but not the court how can when can you say that court had tried that matter in that case court had not tried the matter no doubt merely because the defendant remained ex parte the plaintiff is not automatically entitled for a decree that proposition that would arise when the court feels if i am satisfied with the documents that are filed by the suitor say if it is a money suit there is a promissory note there is a notice there is an acknowledgement and there is non payment the address in the acknowledgement the address in the summons is one and the same he had received acknowledgement he had received the demand notice but not complied he received summons the same address but not attended the court therefore he was set ex parte where is the promissory note legal notice satisfied the claim is allowed any trial involved so what is trial now in the same process let us take defendant appeared contested both sides let in evidence then court allowed the claim and passed a decree is there any difference between those two, two these two decrees in execution a decree obtained ex parte a decree obtained on merits would it make any difference under order 21 rule 11 both decrees have same force there is no stepmotherly treatment or preferential treatment for these kind of decrees so please ponder over because the trial is very important the word trial for the purpose of our amendment because the andhra pradesh high court in that inadu case that ishodaya publications case has held that filing a written statement is a commencement of the trial justice goda raghuram had held so i'll pass on that judgment and that matter was taken to supreme court and without a detailed order supreme court dismissed the appeal therefore we should take that that contention whole school so that is one view that is one view that filing of written state in that case trial had taken place in this in the in example i have given you whether taken place or not see that's what i am saying see this kind of investigation is required because today when it it is often becomes necessary it often becomes necessary to file petition to amend the pleadings so the first problem that one may confront is oh trial has already commenced because many people wake up only when the trial starts and everyone wakes up at at the time of arguments and realizes oh we we ought to have done this or not but it will be too late so what i am telling is this uh, aspect before commencement of the trial is very important in my view of the matter trial is what an issue an issue involved in the matter is tested and answered now even in case where the written statement is not filed strictly there is no issue framed is to no issue framed even in such occasions the court would apply its mind it will not be blindly granting it though they will you may not have the full discussion like a suit which is tried and evidence is reduced you will find satisfied in word satisfied that means the court had applied its mind because even an ex parte matter can be decided on merits merits is what the matter should contain be that ex parte or not there is no unfettered right for the suta to say since the defendant remained ex parte give me a decree that there there that is the trial court exercises its mind satisfaction of the court then it is 
at suit right but see there is a difference between ex parte suit and suit tried tried here in the sense a limited sense of application because in the recent judgment of the supreme court had said an ex parte jud ex parte judgment is one where the court has not gone into the merits of the matter when the merits of the matter would arise only when there is a contest so that is again a different line what constitutes an ex parte order what constitutes an ex parte decree that's different we that may not be directly relevant here suffice it we note the stage of commencement of the trial now tell me the trial commences when evidence is placed before the court is it not here the parties the day they approach the court the within the time fixed by the court or as per the procedure fixed by the court have to file their evidence before the court today i take you are filing a plaint you are filing a verification affidavit stating that the contents of the plaint are correct apart from that you are also filing a proof affidavit along with the plaint a proof affidavit means you have let in your evidence not only your proof, proof affidavit but also the affidavits of the other witnesses whom you intend to examine except that he is a third party who required to be summoned you are procedurally required to file the evidence of affidavits of all the witnesses therefore you have already commenced your trial the the day you file your plaint is it not you have you have put your matter to trial you have put your witnesses to trial now for the defendant to say defendant has not contested so your affidavit remain unchallenged the testimony of you since remain unchallenged and there is no other ground to disbelieve your evidence we are accepting this that is one way the trial has commenced then let us take the defendant defendant files a written statement and he should also file his evidence documents that is the reason why the moment the pleadings are filed it can be construed the trial has commenced what is not commenced is the date of hearing date of hearing because commencement of the trial is not defined or stated anywhere in the court what is stated is hearing of this court let us straight away refer to order 18 rule 2 for clarity on this on the day fixed for hearing of the suit so or on any other day to which the hearing is adjourned the party having the right to begin shall state his case and produce his evidence in support of issues which he is bound to prove so this is hearing on whatever evidence that you have produced before the court in the form of affidavit today the oral evidence by way of chief examination is excluded it's only by way of an affidavit therefore when you have produced your affidavits along with the plaint or the written statement and that are taken on record what was deferred is only hearing on the affidavits so the view of the andhra pradesh high court in the ushodaya publications case that trial commences 
once a written statement has been filed, then perhaps it was for the reason that the both sides have disclosed their contest, not only through their pleadings, but by way of affidavits. Therefore, it was a case where the trial commenced. Hence, party has no unfettered right to seek amendment. But that view, how far other high courts have supported, I have no idea. Though I tried to get some judgments of the other high courts on it, I am unable to secure. So, Andhra Pradesh High Court judgment is of only limited application and it cannot be taken, especially in the light of 18.2. The trial commences only when the stage set under 18.2 comes into play, not just by filing written state. That view at best can be canvassed within the state of Andhra Pradesh. Because as I said, Supreme Court also has not a matter of law had not upheld that judge. Now let us take. So if you are a petitioner in an amendment petition, seeking an amendment, then the when the trial commences is now read 82 again on the day fixed for hearing of this suit. So only when the court fixes the matter for trial, when it will be fixed after framing the issue and after hearing on the issue, including order 10, order 10 comes into play because at the time of framing the issue, the court feels that the matter can be thrashed out at the threshold. It can invoke order 10 and call upon the parties to resolve the disputes, give them, frame a point, give it to them, resolve and decree the suit or dismiss the suit to the extent resolved and continue the suit in case there is no agreement for the total uh, settlement. So friends, the trial commences according to the provision. Trial of matter commences only when the court fixes the date of hearing. Till then, it can be construed that amendment application can be maintained as a matter of right, maintained as a matter of right. I'm not going to the merits of your contention whether it will be allowed or not is different, but it can be maintained and the fetter under the proviso may not operate. This is my view. And I will also give you the case law supporting this view. So, the party who intends to make an amendment to the plea at any stage of the proceedings shall be required to comply the proviso to this subroom two of this, uh, uh, sorry, sub, uh, proviso two subroom 17 of rule six then only it can maintain that application. Now, you know, when this being the position, this being the position under the section, what is the view of the Supreme Court on this? We have two recent rulings of the Supreme Court on this point. Point, point is that if the section says that no application for amendment is permissible after the commencement of the trial unless the court in its discretion finds that parties have exercised due diligence then any application where due diligence is not found is liable to be dismissed so today, if you go by the language used in the section, what is required to be proved is due diligence 
established by the party's due diligence. And despite due diligence, he was unable to plead a point. Therefore, amendment is sought. But let us see what the case law is. Now, we have a, a judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court in matter decided by the Honorable Supreme Court in the matter between M. Revanna versus Anjamma died legal representatives and others. Reported in 2019, four Supreme Court cases, page 332. The, the, this was, the matter was before Honorable Justice N.V. Ramana as he then was, and uh, Mr. Santan Gaundar. And the judgment was delivered by Justice Santan Gaundar. I think this judgment will come in handy to many lawyers while drafting a petition for amendment. Because this judgment rather expand, expanded the scope of Order 6, Rule 17. That is why I prefer to rely on this. Now, let me read at page 333. Please turn to the next page on the top, page 333. Yes. This is a simple application to uh, seeking amendment. No, let us not go into the merits of the petition. We only go by to go into the circumstances. The circumstance is that it is filed after commencement of the crime. I'll read out. Leave to amend uh, leave to amend may be refused if it is introduced in a totally different, new and inconsistent case or challenges the fundamental character of the suit. This is on merit. We are not seriously concerned. But we should bear in mind that an amendment which introduces totally different, new, and inconsistent case or challenges the fundamental character of the suit should be refused. That is on merit. Now we are on the timing. The proviso to Order 6, Rule 17, CPC virtually prevents an application for amendment of pleading from being allowed after the trial has commenced unless the court comes to the conclusion that in spite of due diligence, the party could not have raised the matter before the commencement of the trial. Now, the proviso to an extent contains absolute discretion to allow amendment at any stage. Therefore, the burden is on the person who seeks to amend after commencement of trial to show that in spite of due diligence, such an amendment could not have been sought earlier. Next is important. An amendment cannot be claimed as a matter of right and under all circumstances. Though normally amendments are allowed in the pleadings in order to avoid multiplicity of litigation, the courts need to take into consideration whether the application for amendment is bona fide or malafide, and whether the amendment causes such prejudice to other side, which cannot be compensated adequately by the adequately in terms of money. Right. So, see, there is a little expansion here to the requirement of due diligence. It says in the latter part, though normally amendments are allowed in the pleadings to avoid multiple scams. See, as I said in the beginning, in order to avoid multiplicity, in order to see that a suit attained, a, fi I mean, a final, uh, uh, final conclusion can be arrived at on the controversies, amendments are to be allowed. It is further said, Though normally amendments are allowed in the pleadings to avoid multiplicity of litigation, the court needs to take into consideration 
whether application for amendment is bona fide or mala fide, and whether the amendment causes such prejudice to the other side, which cannot be compensated adequately in terms of money. So the prejudice is one thing. If it is able to, if one is able to establish that no prejudice serious will be caused by this amendment, perhaps by invoking this judgment, one can seek for allowing the petition on this ground alone, whether or not you have a strong ground available that is due diligence. See, there is a little expansion to this. So, while drafting a petition for amendment, one should also, apart from making reliance on that, the, despite due diligence, we were unable to raise this plea, should also say how prejudice will not be caused. Because any amendment given, if allowed to take place, will give rise to a right to file a reply statement by the other side. So, what will be the prejudice caused? These are the things to be stated and convinced. And this judgment may... Why I'm saying this, there is an expansion of the scope. Not mere due diligence. But if you are able to establish that, no prejudice will be caused by allowing the amendment. Perhaps you can stand a pattern. Now, there is yet one more judgment, which is very interesting. This case is also decided by Honorable Supreme Court in, reported in 2019, 5 SCC 628 by Justice D.Y. Chandrachut and Hemant Gurkha. It is a very interesting, very simple, silly issue involved. Nevertheless, the matter went up to the Supreme Court. It's a case where mistake by lawyer in pleading. See, the due diligence applies to parties and not to lawyers while drafting a pleading. Due diligence. To whom? It applies. The party, despite due diligence, failed to plead. Then it cannot be allowed. That is what 1617 says. Right? So, if by mistake, if you take the plea that there is a mistake and the part of the lawyer in making the correct pleading. Therefore, you want it to be amended. Be that a pre-trial, post-trial, can it be allowed? The short question is whether a mistake by lawyer in making a pleading be a ground to allow the amendment pre or post commencement of the trial. What is the answer? Lawyer mistake should not cause any suffering to the party. Right. Now let us see what happened in this case. This is a case where the description of the sutta is wrongly given by the plaintiff. The plaintiff is supposed to be a company limited. It filed a suit against the dependent for recovery of some amounts. And while describing the suit are, if you see the cast title, it has shown the suit are as Varun Pawa. Varun Pawa. Actually, Varun Pawa is only the director. The lender is the company. So if you see this paragraph, that is, uh, you can just Take it little top, the appellant. Up to, uh, yes, para D. Actually, the sutar is the appellant as a director of a private limited company filed a suit for recovery. 
so he filed he is a director of a private limited company he filed the suit for recovery of amount lent by the company so the suitor should be the company not this man he can at best be a representative of the company so the lawyer instead of describing the ex company represented by this power who is the director had filed the suit as if this director had lent the money that was the mistake then when summons were served on the defendant the defendant filed an application to dismiss the suit because uh, there is a separate procedure contemplated under the code of civil procedure for filing a suit against the companies you can't simply file a suit against the company without following the procedure under section and order 28 and section 20 cpc so definitely it's a procedural wrong so the issue is it is a mistake on the part of the lawyer because parties are not expected to know the how they have to be described when they are the suitors or when they are the dependents so the question is when he wanted the plaintiff wanted the amendment be made the trial court said no you can't you have violated the procedure and you can't cure a violation by making an amendment therefore the amendment was refused the matter went to the high court high court conferred with the trial court order and said no we will not interfere then the matter went to supreme court and the supreme court had expanded the scope of this 16 now two judgments referred in this are very very important the reason for coming to the conclusion is supreme court ultimately held that the procedural defects and irregularities which are curable should not be allowed to defeat substantive rights keeping that principle in mind though the procedure says that you have to plead like this but you have pleaded differently therefore it is wrong the procedure says that you should seek an amendment before commencement of the trial but you have come later these procedural rules should not defeat substantive justice therefore having quoted the two earlier after having quoted two earlier judgments of the supreme court which you find in this judgment which i don't want to read as you will be punished with the citation you can as well read then it is said in conclusion we find that this is the conclusion we find that it was an inadvertent mistake in the plain which the trial court should have allowed to be corrected so as to permit the private limited company to sue as plaintiff as the original plaintiff has filed the suit as director instead of company therefore order declining to correct the names of the parties cannot be said to be justified in law so a bona fide mistake on the part of the client is now a ground so if you can bring your application under the purview of a bona fide mistake i am sure this judgment will be of your help so an amendment no doubt can be sought subject to the compliance of these requirements of course there is a next phase of discussion what can be amended what cannot be amended can you take away an admission by way of an amendment what you admitted can it be allowed to be taken can you plead inconsistency can you set up a new case can you get over the bar of estoppel by pleading this is another area which is covered by the rulings of the supreme court but i, have, uh, I don't think i am justified in taking for the time of you today as i have taken more than hours time now to explain 
very small points. See, I always feel explaining tiny things takes more time than explaining big things. That's one possibility. Second thing, a person who cannot explain things in short takes more time to explain things. Either of things have, might have happened in my case. And I have been putting the organizers on caveat every time that unless you set me a time limit and put a clock and allow me when I'm exceeding the time, I forget time. I keep on talking, talking. Sometimes this may not be germane to the situation. Therefore, pardon me, I've taken more time, but my, my, uh, my views and my submissions, my presentation is inconclusive. So, though I take the risk of losing some more participants by next year, in, yet for the sake of my satisfaction, let me have one more session which is suitable and if permissible by the organizers so that I can conclude saying what can be uh, amended, what cannot be amended, and then postpone there, then, then conclude this prolonged agony to the listeners. Hope, uh, before that, any interaction subject to time? I think somebody should caution me about the time because I totally lost. Suddenly, I looked at the watch this time. Somehow, I get this problem. Okay. So anything that we need to discuss today further, we'll go. Next, we can call it a day. Any question or anything? Any doubt, anything? In Sir, any questions, uh, you can use the raise hand option or you can post it in the chat box. There is one question from Mr. Satish. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir, good afternoon. CSK Satish, sir. Oh, Mr. Satish, how are you? Fine, sir, fine, sir. Very kind of you, sir, for your uh, the intellectual feast you have given to us. Really? And uh, I'm very sure, sir, we can uh, improve our drafting skills after uh, listening to your uh, lecture. Sir, my question is twofold. As far as pleading, sir, sir, what sort of yardstick we should use in constructing the pleadings which are drafted in uh, High court that is on original side, and the pleadings which are normally drafted in subordinate courts, because sir has the experience of both sides. That is one part of my question, and second part of question is with regard to sir, sir put a question to us that when trial commences, trial commences as far as an order is suits under order seven. As Sir rightly pointed out, once the written statement is filed, in fact, if that is the yardstick, Sir, can you kindly clarify us what would be the position in cases of summary suits? In summary suits, there is no question of written statement unless leave is granted. So my question is up to fold. Yes, well. Uh... Uh, now I will answer the, your first question first. See, the whether it is a high court or a trial court, once we are talking about the original side, the adherence to the rules of pleadings is must so as to have a proper pleading. Though it is the high court that will decide a suit like uh, say certain high courts like Chennai, Tamil Nadu High Court has got uh, original jurisdiction on the suits which is not there for many other states. It is once it tries a suit filed before it it is like any other civil court. It doesn't get any better status than a trial court is on par with a district court or a subordinate court or as a trial court as far as the procedure of trying the suit is concerned. Now coming to the quality of it, 
I can say without any hesitation that the trial court pleadings are always stronger, much akin to the established procedure and well drafted. The pleas that are taken in the Mofasin bars, in the district bars, are such that the high courts and the Supreme Court were able to lay a law on important issues. After all, the law that today we have, the, the interpretation, the case law, is all due to the pleadings in the trial courts only. Very rarely we find a law being laid, a decision rendered applicable to the larger section of litigations on the judgments rendered by the high courts on the original side. So I always say with the trial courts and trial courts pleadings are far better than the high court original side pleadings. But there, there will be exceptions everywhere. I can tell with my experience while I was discharging my duties as presiding officer DRT. There are nearly 30 suits filed on the original side of the Chennai High Court were transferred, money suits, to DRT in view of enactment of RDBM. So they virtually they were suits prepared and then brought before me. And the we also have some suits filed before trial courts transfer. A comparison of those two, I mean, it's a very limited. I had only seen 25 to 30 suits. I felt more comfortable with the suits drafted by the lawyers practicing in the trial courts and uh, district courts rather than the filed in the high court. They were more or less in the form of a writ petitions which were filed in the high court. So this is my personal view. Well, maybe uh, many may not accept, but I've seen tested the comfort level for a, a presiding officer is much more when we deal with the pleadings by trial courts than the high courts. That's why. Then come in, coming to the commencement of the trial. See, uh, today it is uh, uh, the, the, the procedural aspect of a matter which is not summary in nature has taken a sea change. Like you are expected to file your entire evidence in the form of affidavits along with the plaint, along with your written statement. So virtually you have put in everything before the court to thrash out the controversial issues. The trial is not always mandatory. Trial is not always mandatory. Trial is when a tribal issue arises. So, by your contest, by your written statement, if it is found that you are not in agreement with the terms of the plaintiff set in the plaintiff of the case of the plaintiff, and you are raising certain objections, so you are not accepting. So a, a point raised, a point denied, it's an issue. Issue requires trial. That's all. So, one view of mine is that the trial automatically commences once a written statement is filed. That is the view that I do hold. Though technically, under 18.2, the court must fix the date of commencement of trial. My view is commencement date is deferred, but already trial is ripe. It is ripe. Its commencement is only deferred. So I am also of the view that the moment the affidavit's defense is filed, it is tried. It comes to stage of trial. Now coming to the summary suits. See, in summary suits, I in fact, what is the procedure under the RTB Act is only summary. It doesn't talk about anything, examine the affidavits and pass it on. There is no trial at all. 
in my view there is no trial at all only giving opportunity to the parties to address on the controversial points that's all we are enlarging it we are giving different different uh, ways of opportunities to the parties saying you file this uh, or i'm giving you time to file it in a in a in a summary trial in a summary trial there are no issues we only frame a point and then there is no trial we we are giving it that's a different matter because tribunal can set its own procedure but if you speak in terms of the code of civil procedure it is by examining the record and then pass an order the court must get satisfied for that purpose the court may adopt different views different measures different ways and means which is uh, within the framework of which uh, allowed which is allowed under the code of civil procedure that's all so in case of summary trials the bar under 1617 617 order 617 i don't think would even abstract i would say there is no trial at all why would i i can present at any time that would be my argument in case i am the petitioner in summary trial summary procedures there is no summary trial at all summary procedure summons procedure like in the crp is just summary it is summary take the entire gist decide the gist can be taken from affidavit support sides nobody is exempted from filing affidavits that both sides shall file it right? so from the affidavits we take from the documents we take decide any doubt we have we ask them to argue that is what is the intention but we are giving different shapes we are giving different types doing different things that's all so this is what i feel so with your permission i will just step in sir yes. uh, firstly we can have one more session also sir the uh, the organizers would be very happy to have one more session on this subject your convenience sir you can set out a date and time we can go for the third session on the same point and further continue secondly sir there are some few posts in the chat box i just want to read out to you uh, advocate bonesh has said that there is an excellent session and knowledge transfer has happened really very well then advocate chelimuthu from coimbatore says we learn from the respected speakers effort that there is no retirement for learning definitely there will be a change in drafting style of participants hereafter then uh, mr s suri siva suri and arayan from tirunelveli writes generally knowledge multiplies when divide or share with others here we have multiples over our knowledge salute for your honors lecture so these are the few posts which i just wanted to read out and probably before we conclude we will have uh, rajshekar because he had uh, raised his hand for long and waiting for it sir with rajshekar's question probably with what of thanks we will end and uh, you can fix up one more date for a further session yeah Next week, any day time? Yes, we will. I don't have any work. So, Raj Shekhar, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Ah, uh, thanks, sir. Thanks for the opportunity. So it was really a wonderful lecture, and uh, of course, even as seniors, we also learn. And as you have said, when you keep reading the section again and again, you you get more knowledge, and you try to you know interpret in a different fashion. So now, readings is definitely the foundation for any lawyer. And especially when juniors, they have to be very, very strong in pleadings. That is going to stand till the end of the case. Now, uh, my, uh, I have, in fact, even I uh, have come across certain cases where I had found found it difficult to frame the prayer. In some suits, to frame the prayer also, you, we find difficulties. So, prayer it forms part of the pleading. So, there, my uh, endeavor is. Uh, Is is not order to rule too important in a when a lecture and a pleadings order to rule too which says that uh, we cannot miss uh, a cause of action. I mean, uh, it, order to rule too is something which says that all the claim should be there in the suit. If you miss a uh, claim, then probably you cannot uh, file another case because of the bar specific bar order to rule too. So as juniors, I think they should also know about that. you have comments on that see drafting a prayer and order to rule to uh, with due respect to your views i don't think has got any direct connection prayer is uh, 
sort basing on the facts that involved uh, that are involved in a particular case if uh, money is given and not returned we ask for return of money with interest if land is encroached we ask for recovery of possession if title is denied we will ask for a declaration and whether the possession is with you with you without possession this depends upon this because basic relief act also laid down uh, what are the requirements in case of declared issues now order to rule to is that if a suit or omits to seek relief for the entire cause of action he cannot later on without the leave of the court ask for it for instance in a promissory note one lakh rupees is the amount lent the borrower uh, the lender had come to you to file a suit and if the advocate to whom the lender had gone and says one lakh rupees is the court fees then this man says i have only 50000 can i file it for 50% na 50000 now and uh, later on for 50000 see the promissory note is for 1 lakh for 1 lakh promissory note let us say the court fee is 1 lakh or even say 10000 but the lender says i have only 5000 now i can't pay 10000 so i want to sue for 50000 and for the rest 50000 i will sue later and then if you file a suit for 50000 Pay five thousand court fee. It is numbered and tried. And afterwards, this man comes with another five thousand, and you want to file for the remaining fifty thousand also. Then you are not entitled unless you take the leave of the court. So where a cause of action has arisen, and you are only interested in suing for a part, but for not for the remaining part. then you have to obtain a leave under order to rule 2 and if the leave is granted you can later so otherwise you can that is it so that has not uh, directly concerned with the prayer it's only reserving the right when a cause of action is an entire cause of action you have to you can't split i'll do half now i will do later and if you you can do that provided you take the leave of the court for that you have to file a petition in terms of order to rule to and the court will grant normally they will grant and then so reserve the right for example recovery of possession you have not asked you have only asked for a simple special performance and reserve your right to seek for recovery of possession for that order to rule to. later on you can sue subject to limitation then thank you so very interesting no i'm just getting reminded of all this i'm totally off the practice for so many years so you are taking the risk by asking questions also to me how far i am able to convince you i'm not sure but of course this order to rule to being a procedural section a little memory i have i think with that i am able to answer it to some extent at least yes any other question There are actually multiple compliments for your session today, uh, Mr. Koka Srinivasan Kumar and uh, Mr. Murugesan have said that this was an excellent and fantastic presentation, and that they are continuing for it. Ms. Rajeshwari has said that extensive knowledge sharing by yourself, which will go a long way in drafting pleadings in future with more clarity, confidence, and satisfaction. With that being said, I would now like to invite Mr. Varun to give the vote of thanks and close the session. you have developed huge patience i can uh, certify that you are all the persons with huge patience which is one of the facets of a good lawyer otherwise you wouldn't have you are you wouldn't have been here till this uh, end of the session thank you for your patience again right thank you ritika <laughs> on behalf of the study circle seniors and uh, other young lawyers i would thank you sir for uh, spending your time and wisdom with us it was a very useful and uh, practical session in which uh, we had discussed about the uh, material facts in pleadings in the previous session importance of the material facts and in this session we had uh, seen about the uh, commencement of trial amendment of pleadings 
by referring to case laws and uh, specific denials of governments and allegations made in claims. Uh, therefore, I conclude by saying uh, we are hereby fortunate to have you in the next session, sir. Uh, and this uh, link could be provided in the WhatsApp group uh, by the team members. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all.